in a lot of enterprises, if you will ask the business, they will tell you that, yeah, I'm sending them a request and I need to wait two months before even getting to the table. So I think that this kind of the new tool or new modern stack helping the engineers actually to be better in their job. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 204. Transform data from managed to actionable with Rivery. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your host, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, here we are getting close to the end of the first quarter in 2023, and people are still trying to find jobs. What do you think the problem with that is? Big uh, companies rebalancing their mistakes. I have a theory about it. I don't know if you want to go through it now, but uh, I, I think that big guys like Apple and Netflix and so on and so forth uh, just went too crazy with salaries and everything and are using partly the crisis as a way to rebalance all that. And today we're talking with Itamar from Rivery, and you're thinking, okay, what does all of this have to do with it? Well, one of those big areas that I've seen a lot of people being cut out in is in the data space, right, Itamar? Is that what you've been seeing as well? Yes, absolutely. It's, um, we see it across the board. Uh, I think it's um, in in the in the data in particular. The, the, there is a still a gap of uh, resources, but uh, the problem what happened in the past in you know what in the past few years that companies raised a lot of money based on the growth and the mission to grow no matter what and now what you know this is and and you know the the finance people wants to see more capital efficiency so what makes the companies to to push the run rate as much as they can and you know unfortunately the the way to do it is to is to reduce the biggest line in your in your balance sheet, and which is the the people. So it's kind of reorganizing the industry as a whole. We'll come back and we'll talk through that the, the through lines and all that. But Rivery is a an ETL as a SaaS, or can you say ETL at AAS? That would be too weird to say. I don't know how you would even say that. I come back from the old days of ETL where. Anytime I heard that, that meant the data was going to a data warehouse or we were just flipping it to do, this was before pivot tables. Yes, there was a time before pivot tables, people. How, how has ETL changed over the years? Let's, you know, can we talk about the history of ETL real quick and then see how this whole data process actually ties into headcount? I think it. Uh the ETL and specifically the, um, the transition is combining two, two angles. One is the, is the SaaS, the ability to work in a SaaS. If you want to compare it to what Google BigQuery or like uh, Snowflake or Databricks did for the data warehousing. And another angle, um, you, can, you, can, you can check this out, is, uh, is the self-service. People wants to be because the lack of resources people wants to see more better ease of use and and more let's say fastest to value tools comparing to the legacy uh, players this transition by the way you can see in the old days in the reporting tool from cognos business object shifting to self-service tools like tableau uh, alterix uh, click so we're seeing these two angle 
self-service plus the SaaS uh, combined together into the modern data platform, um, modern ELT. There are other components, technical components in the in the new ELT industry versus the legacy ETL. The big thing is is the ability to connect fast within one click to any source of data. This is one one big challenge that becoming to be more and more commodities nowadays. The second thing is the the way you run the transformation. Um, if you think about that. ETL is extract, transform, and load means that the transformation happening in the ETL server, what we call. Now it's all pushed down to the new technologies like Google, like AWS, like uh, Snowflake. So this is why the trans- it, it's became to be a transition to the ELT extract load. First of all, replicate from 100 sources replicate my data set into my Snowflake, let's say. And from that point, all the transformation is literally pushed down on top of the Snowflake, Google, and, and other data lakes or data warehouses in the cloud. Those are the big, the two big changes I, 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 as I see it. And when I was reviewing the site, I saw ELT, but in my head, because I'm old, I saw ETL. And so hearing you spell out, okay, we're moving from extract now in, in 2023 to load, then to transform. So let's tie this ETL, ELT, and this headcount thing that's going on. So companies want to be more efficient. Companies want to be more, you know, close to the business. This is why majority of the new solutions going directly with mix of business and IT. It's no longer only IT running a project, data project, and not the, and, and also the business not running by themselves. From one hand, you are building here an infrastructure, so you want to make sure that the engineering team are part of it, security-wise, uh, certifications and validations and best practices. So you want to make sure that you are building the, the best infrastructure. So this is why you need the engineering in around the table. But in the same time, the business now is not like it used to be like, you know, 15 years ago. And I'm also working on this in this industry more than 20 years. So the business at that time were I'm asking a business question, a request for a report or something like that, and the IT will provide. It's no longer happening. The business holding the budget, they are getting the decision, involving the decision, whether from the CDO or from the CTO or from the CFO, no matter what, the business have a big impact on the, on the stack that you are choosing. So this is actually bring us to a very good progress in this field because the buyer becoming to be more business oriented, more and seeing how this can scale and help me with the gap in, in resources in the fastest time and the most efficient way. So the new solutions like Rivery, they are trying to bridge this gap between the business and the IT and trying to do to help the organization to do more with less, let's say, you know, so if I built another two companies in the past, consulting firm, hundreds of people in, in the, in North America and kind of consulting firm in Israel. Project that we used to do in, you know, with a team of five, six, seven months. Now you can do with a modern solution within a month, within weeks, because a lot of the assets already there and available for the customer to take it and tailored their, their solution, but with, a, let's say, templates that it's already built 90%. One word you've been using a lot is fastest. You've used it standalone. You've used it in the context of fastest value tools. I imagine this isn't just a data thing, especially the phrase fastest value tools. Companies are wanting to, as you said, get more for less. It's obvious, right, from a business perspective, but what does that mean for us that actually do the work, right? We're we're being told because somebody went out and played a game of golf that, hey, here's this new tool that we've got to get implemented next week. 
because it's going to be simple because the salesperson told us it was going to be simple. How do we, as the people now that have to deal with these tools, not, not just data tools, but in, in, every, anything, how do we stand a chance? So I think that we need to be, we all engineers and we need to be open-minded to what's going on in the industry and what the business needs and what, where my company is, is moving ahead. And the best way to do it is, is first do the, uh, the proof of value and the, the proof of concept, validate everything that you know from the old world, because the, the traditional world came with a lot of principles and, and foundation. And, and what I saw is that because the tools becoming to be really easy to use, I saw a lot of engineers that not ready actually to use it because they are missing a lot of principles and foundation that's coming with experience or coming with with the old world that we used to work really really hard in order to make any any progress so i think that it's not quick and win you need to validate the tool you need to work with it you need to be able to use a tool even the friendly tools you need to validate for a certain of time, run it with two weeks, three weeks, one month, check this out, how we deal with edge cases, how it works for me in my current environment and not that what the sales team told me. So once you are doing this validation, then in this case, I'm saying that you need to be open mindset to get and open the door for those new tools. It's not going, it's actually will empower you as an engineer to focus more on the business value. End of the day, you, the IT in a lot of enterprises, if you will ask the business, they will tell you that, yeah, I'm sending them a request and I need to wait two months before even getting to the table. So I think that this kind of the new tool or new modern stack helping the engineers actually to be better in their, in their job. And it's not necessarily to, you know, replacing people. It's actually empower them to bring more value in fastest time, but also in the most efficient way, which is not less important. Let's go back to the the initial case to where people were overhired into these companies. And obviously a lot of people, you know, they were hired in a month ago, now they're gone. But you still got the people that have been there for you know, five, 10 years, we used to be able to say 15 and 20, but that just doesn't happen hardly anymore. At some point tools like rivery, like other tools, not just data tools, but other tools everywhere else are going to be coming easier and easier. The buzzword that we're hearing for 2023 is, and I'm tired of saying it already is platform engineering. Right. You even alluded to it a little bit to where you're coming in sort of as a platform for data management. You didn't use those words, but go with me for a minute. At least it's in that ballpark, right? I've been around now for five or 10 years within a company. And now this whole new tool set is coming in on top of me, right? It's being integrated into this platform that's being built for our company internally in our platform. And it's like, what do I do? It's like, I've been there five or 10 years. Do I suck it up and enjoy it? Or do I leave? No, enjoy it. Enjoy it. It makes your life way more efficient. It's like, you know, in the transition from horses to, to cars, you know, you can say, yeah, it won't happen uh, when Henry Ford brought the first car. So end of the day, it's what, will bring you and again empower you as an engineer to bring better value to your organization you don't need to to see it as a threat you need to see it as a complementary tool end of the day is a fuse it's still a platform that required engineer to work on this one when we are coming with our solution to into an enterprise or like insurance companies so yes to do replication from your on-prem database to Snowflake used to take months to design and build your tailored solution and eventually didn't work because you did it for your company. 
and you always deal with the problem. And then coming a new tools like Riverby, for example, and it takes you five minutes to configure the system. And now it's running, but we still need to define the right processes, the right schema in the other side, in the snowflake, to redesign the structure of the data sets that you have there. So there are so many things to do, at least in data, that it's, it's something that is it's really required engineers and, and good engineers. As for the transition now with the companies, it's very simple. You know, maybe the, the salaries uh, Victor said before that went too high, too fast. So now I see it as, a, you know, historically, you will see it as a, a year or two that, you know, we did something like this and now we are changing a bit the paradigm. But, but it's not actually the revolution of technology still happening, still required, and it's, it, will keep, it will keep the momentum, maybe in, in lower volume, which is okay. Not all the companies need to shift their entire technologies in one day. It's take a process. If you speak about enterprise, the digital transformation is a process of five years, six years. It's not plug and play. Okay. So I get the feeling that people sometimes thinking it's plug and play. No, these solutions are not coming in and they're making a lot of things more accessible and, and features more available for you to make it faster, but it's not plug and play. And no one can replace the, the knowledge of the internal data set and the data model in your specific business line. You cannot uh, um, build everything as a, as a one template. When we say template, here, this is the template for your industry. You take this out, but it's baseline. And now you will do your custom implementation and tailor adjustment based on what you did before, based on what you have with this tool or where, you know, what you have with other tools like Snowflake or Google or whatever. I want to call out a couple of things that you said there. These tools make it accessible, but they're not plug and play. I think that's key that the people buying these things need to understand. No matter how good the salesperson is, right? Because you're, you're, you're walking the line, right? As the CEO, you know, you want, you want to sell this as much as possible, but I can hear in your voice that you want the people to, yeah, you want them to have the product, but you want them to be successful with the product, right? <laughs> you must have them be successful. Exactly. Otherwise they're going to kick you out. Right. So having things, accept, having people understand that it's an accessible problem and not a plug and play problem is is a big deal uh internal knowledge never goes away a tool never replace internal knowledge because and sort of joking aside everyone is a snowflake all right they're, they're not using snowflake but everyone is a snowflake because of the way people treat a user's table in one company is different how they treat a user's table in another company how do i know that and the other thing that you said that was interesting was having templates for industry how has that played out for you? Because that sort of makes sense, right? You're, you're going to have a template that's going to work for retail banking. You're going to have a template that's going to work for public sector. You have a retail or a template that works for insurance, right? All of those are fairly well-known entities. But how in reality does a template even help with that? I mean, again, to me, that template would be so generic. I don't know how it would even be useful. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm just saying that there are industry solutions that ma you know, a majority of the industry using the same tools, okay? So if I'm a SaaS company, most likely my CRM is Salesforce. NetSuite will be my billing system. My tickets and R&D working with Jira. Um, Zendesk for, you know, support. So if I want to build now a business ops solution, I most likely will get the data from all of those sources and majority of the companies will, will, will implement it as a plain vanilla. So you already have 
the basic foundation to how to get the data set, what is the data set that you need to bring from each system, and how to combine them together. And now, this is the beautiful that you will do in the tailor. Until now, this is the templates. And then you are taking these basics, and now you will add your product data. You will add your database, internal databases into the model. You will normalize and build the model that combined more assets you have in the organization into this model. So I'm saying that in that case, you can have 60, 70% of the hard on the hard mission to get data from external and, and how should I connect between this data set from Salesforce to this data set in, in Jira. And combining all of this together out of the box is a good start for you before tailored your own needs and, and your, your own data set. And this one, each company is diff totally different. So I'm saying that you have halfway and it's, this is the halfway that you don't really know, knows it, uh, in, as an organization in general. You don't really know how, what is the metadata in other systems. But the opposite, you know better than anyone what is the structure of your internal data set. And there's no, you know, you need to combine them together. So you, this is, this is when we say templates. It's, it's, uh, you cannot again categorize the entire industry. Okay. This is what you need to do. It's, the best, the best platform and infrastructure if in the world, whether for CRM, billing, or, or data, it's the ones that giving you the foundation and you are implementing your own model. Your proposition on templates are it's a halfway at best. And the way you stacked it out was, okay, you've got Salesforce, you've got NetSuite, you've got Jira, you've got whatever the other one was. Okay, you you fall into this bucket. Here's the four basic integrations. Fill out these because I can leverage a little bit. Here, fill out these ten fields, and off we go. Right, and then and then you start doing the real work. May, and maybe there is a report out of that, right? Maybe there is a because you're running as a SaaS. You see what other people are doing. I would assume at least you have some knowledge. Maybe not full data knowledge, but you can at least see patterns emerging. To where now that can be rolled into your template, which then makes it a little bit better for your end users. Can we get a little nerdy for a second? Maybe. So you're a SaaS. And it makes sense how you connect to the Snowflakes and the Salesforces because it's all public internet. How do you deal with self-managed, not on the public internet? So we are, in general... If someone wants to build an on-prem solution, we are not the solution for them. So we are not cloud or SaaS evangelist. We are coming when the company already decided to move to, to cloud. And, and now what are the sets of tools that I, that will help me to get there in the, in the most efficient way? So speaking about that, we can connect to your on-prem data sets. And, you know, we have, architect in the organization that built uh, the connector that to take you through there, you know, with all of the certifications and, and, the, and the security mechanism. So you will trust us when connecting your on-prem database, you know, private link, SSH tunnel, VPN, all of those, those capabilities that we have, you must have as an out of the box. And the enterprise companies using those tool sets to add another layer. So make sure that the tunnel that we built is directly from your on-prem to your specific instance at Snowflake or Google or AWS or Azure. So this is, this is, this is the tools, but it always will be only to get data from the on-premise into the cloud. We will never write data into the on-prem. Uh, we had a lot of requirements for that one. I'm, I want to say more than like, four years, three years ago, when we just launched the, the, the company and we said no. And I'm now I'm really happy that we said no, because this could take us to different journey. And, and where we are now at is where, where the market is going. The market still going to the, to the SaaS and cloud and, and less control everything inside of my, uh, my, yes, my internal environment. 
It's interesting because if people are self-managing their data, they could still do it in cloud. So, you know, it's still going to be the same problem. How do you convince people that cloud isn't a horrible thing? And I'm not going to say it's normal, but it's at least accepted now. I think that to justify a budget of millions of dollars to buy servers that as soon as you start working with them is not up to date and the implementation, the electricity and the, and the, and the space and the room that you need for that one. It's no longer a, a question, okay? So companies decided to move to, to the cloud, in the cloud, um, I think that both Amazon and AWS and Google understood that they need to help this kind of organizations and help them together by building a private cloud, by building an isolated solution for me as an, as, as an organization, dedicated servers. So we have the cloud vendors, they built the right infrastructure and the right solution to help, you know, their the companies that struggle in to put things somewhere else and not to control it and see it and watch the, the server every morning. So they are helping them together. Uh, I think it's a fact now. And now it's, we all need to see how we are making this better and works better for everyone, more secured, with the right foundation, as I mentioned, right principles, and make it best value for, for us as individual and for us as an, as an organization. Let's take it one step further. You were talking primarily about on-premise in four walls. How do you convince people that they should be using the services of these big cloud vendors? We'll stick with AWS. Why should they just use RDS or Aurora instead of them building their own EC2 instances and then installing Maria MySQL on it? Because I think it's, it's, it's fastest and you need to do your ROI calculation. You need to see what is required for me to build this one and how much will cost me to maintain it. What is the availability that we'll have? And now compare this to, to the managed service. And then you, you, you do the math. Maybe in some organization it won't work and, and it's required to redesign and build it internally. It's, I don't see it as a, as a problem. I'm just saying that you need to do the true ROI and the full TCO for your organization. End of the day, the organization paying you a salary to do the best for, for the organization. For trust me, the CEO of insurance company, he doesn't care and he doesn't know if it's fully managed a solution RDS by AWS or by the local developer. He doesn't care as long as it works, as long as it serves the organization. This is what I want to measure as a manager. And and end of the day, this is our mission as a team. As an individual, we cannot work for our CV only. You know, we want to make sure that we are doing interesting things, that we are doing complex things. But in the same time, there is a transition now to manage cloud solutions. So you want to to work next to that one and, and collaborate with this tool and, and that's fine. Be suspicious. That's fine. Be, be hard to get, you know, show me and convince me that it's actually works. But end of the day, you need to be, you know, transparent with yourself and with the organization that you are choosing the right solution for the organization and, and not necessarily the level of code that you will, you, you will write. And again, it's, I believe that the, 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 the mission is so a way more bigger than us, you know, even myself as a, as a company and a managed solution. I don't think that it's Rivery solve all your problems. No, Rivery bring you a tool set and infrastructure that serve you to make your mission better. Now we come back full circle. We're now back at the point of it's bigger than us. And if you want to minimize your risk of being the next one cut off from your company, 
keep up with the tools. Take the tools, figure it out to the best. Now, if you're the buyer, be nice to your people. But if you're on the receiving end of the buyers, take the tools, figure it out to the best of your ability. And if it doesn't work, okay, maybe it is time to move on. I have comment on this one. The buyer is actually the user. So if you think about, I, I'm speaking about my product, and of course there are many products that are very the same. End of the day, we are selling to the user. SaaS is not a product that you are selling $1 million and then you have maintenance of 20% here over here. No, it's a service. And if you are as a user, in my case, data engineer, data analyst that using the product and is not satisfied, he won't recommend to the buyer inside of the organization to buy that product. And this is why we are targeting to work with the users. We, and, and most likely, you know, I, out of hundreds of customers that we have, I remember very few that it came from, from the buyer to the developer or to the engineer. In general, it's the opposite. The engineers start to work with the product. There is a free trial, pre-configured, you configure everything. Most likely your manager doesn't know that you are trying this tool. You are doing a, a trial and POC. Since it's not so complex and easy to use, you get results really fast. So you, you, you understand the value proposition right away. And then you are going to the buyer and bring them in to the conversation. So it's the trans, the, the, the revolution, the true revolution is coming from the, from the bottom up, not top down. So it's, it's actually a, a bit different than what you just described. If I may, may, you know, to, it's really different. It's not, it's not that landing on people from the sky. Hey, you need to buy this tool because why? Because it's modern. No, no one will accept that one. No one will buy. No one will, will succeed in the implementation. End of the day, is a fuse or not, it's an infrastructure. What you just said is one of the most important changes. I remember like 20 years ago, right? CTO just makes, a, after two years of negotiating with IBM, makes a decision, brings everything in, and then everybody hates that guy. But it's still happening. Uh, I see it a lot with uh, hyper, uh, hyperscalers. Big companies are moving from on-prem to hyperscalers, which is great. But typically, it doesn't matter whether engineers prefer Google over Azure or what's or not. Those are such big deals that the top management negotiates the rates and what's or not. With others, I completely agree, kind of bottom up, right? But with hyperscalers, usually still very much top down. I didn't see it. You know, yeah, to decide which cloud you are running at, which decision of, of millions, many millions, this in general will be top down. I totally agree with you. I mean, which makes sense if you, if you can kind of like renegotiate from 5 million to 4 million. End of the day, even that you need to validate because the, the bill of 5 million and 10 million or whatever, then you need to see what you need for you to implement. So the TCO should be included, the certification, the engineering and, and everything, and not only the, the payment that you are paying for the infrastructure. Talk to us a little bit more about Rivery, and I did happen to notice that on Wednesday, and I don't know, is it every Wednesday there's a live demo? Yes, every Wednesday. Great. So tell us more about Rivery and, and what happens if I happen to show up for a demo. Yes, so Rivery, again, we, maybe a bit the history, I built uh, two, before Rivery, I built another two companies, one in Israel and one in, in North America, when, and literally I I'm building data warehouses for living for more than 20 years. And what we saw is that the transition to the cloud the trans and, and the, the problem and the complexity to get data from now, it's no more from one database or two files. It's actually from endless services out there. 
So there is a big gap of integrate. First of all, bring me the data, get the data from these sources. And again, if you're speaking about enterprise, we are speaking about hundreds of sources. Um, some of them native and some of native connectors and some of them custom connector that you create in the platform. So, so we saw this gap and we said, okay, how we can help our customer to make it faster. And this is how we came into Reverie and, and built as a bootstrap inside of my previous company to just to serve, to have a better serve to our customers and not every project to start with a down payment of 100K to just to connect the data and bring the, do the same mission over and over. So we created the MVP. We started to work in 2019. We launched the activity in the US, started to sell again, still really small business. And then we decided to go and raise money and, and spin off the technology and make it a, b a big company. So we started the company in January 2020. I'm based in the US. My team in Israel at that time, five people. And we grew a lot now, hundreds, serving hundreds of customers globally. And the mission is actually help data engineers and data citizen, let's say, to get better accessibility to the data. How we are doing it? By providing you ease of use infrastructure or self-service infrastructure to get the data from any source, EL, extract and load, then running the transformation or even running complex program solutions with Python. So you have the, the infrastructure to do that as well. And all of this managed by a wide solution managed orchestration to help you to define the schedule and the integration with third party and, and other tools that you have in the stack. So uh, so yeah, this is this is Reverie to simplify the, the ETL or mission, let's say, and the ability to manage your data in, in the most efficient way. So all of Itamar's contact information will be down in the show notes along with links off to Reverie. Itamar, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate a lot. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox.